My parents were both migrants from Greece. My mother came out in the early 60s, my father in the early 50s. Uh, they met. We're never going to meet in Greece because different parts of Greece, but they met in Carlton of all places, where, where else are you going to meet? Mm -hmm. And uh, at, my sister and I and my mum, for the first trip back after they'd migrated separately, uh, was in 1976, and Greece in those days was just coming out of military dictatorship. So the junta, the colonels, ran the country for about seven years, and they'd just returned to democracy at this point, and we were still a fairly... Uh, well, the common term now is battlers. We weren't that well off. And uh, first trip to the shops in the province of uh, Castoria, where, um, where mum grew up, uh, I saw some LPs. And I must have been a shitty little kid, pardon the, <laughs> pardon the swear word this early in the morning, because we didn't have a record player at home, but I was quite keen to get some LPs into my collection before we bought the record player. So I nagged her and nagged her and nagged her, and she bought for me... Uh, not one, but two Beatles records, which were the first two Beatles records. The thing about these two, two records, A, we didn't have, bear in mind we didn't have a record player, so... <laughs> and we weren't going to get a record player any time soon. <laughs> but, like I said, I must have been a strange little kid. I was nagging her. I, I had this sort of deep-seated fear that the Beatles would become passe or past tense and all their LPs would be remained and you'd never be able to see it in a shop again. So <laughs> I had the version of a consumer panic attack. Mum felt sorry for me. Uh, the exchange rate must have been pretty good. The Australian dollar then traded pretty well against the Greek drachma. So these two things, which would have been unobtainable for me, in Melbourne, because I had a temper to nagger before when we were in Melbourne, suddenly became um, objects she was prepared to purchase for me. Now, there's a couple more things that we, that we did buy on that trip, because uh, my aunt was there, her elder sister was there, and the guy that ran this record shop, at some point she said, you know, humour this kid, he doesn't have a record player, he's not going to be able to hear these LPs for a little while, and he said, oh, you know what I can do? I can play you, I can, I can tape you some of these LPs. So, absolute breach of copyright. <laughs> Personal use, it's OK. <laughs> Personal <laughs> use, right? So, apart from these two, uh, there was also a, a, the Wings album, Band on the Run, and then there was a tape of the Beatles compilation 67 to 70, which was the blue album, yep. the double LP, on this really, really crappy little tape. And that's all I played when I got home. So even though I had these two little things to, uh, to sort of look forward to popping the platter on the, on the record player, it took quite a while before I actually got to hear either of these records, but I did have the cassette. Uh, the other thing which is interesting about... When you think today about how people consume anything, in those days, A, we've had a record player. I used to sit next to the transistor radio with the one finger on the record button, the other finger on the play button, put the two down, the way you went if you heard your favourite song. And so, uh, you know, for years I'd, I'd have these little mixtapes which I'd play on this... It was a dictaphone, really. It wasn't anything more spectacular than a dictaphone. And that was essentially my music collection until these things entered the household. And again, as I say, we weren't that well off, so it took about a, another year before the purchase came into the... either the actual record player came into the house and we could, pop, um, we could pop these platters on. Now, we've got some music we can queue up. Yes, yep. Uh, these are very rare Greek pressings of these uh, records, too. So. <laughs> oh, by the way, they are. And in fact, God knows, whether they're rip-offs or not, I don't know. Um, and so they, they, would have been, they would have been manufactured in a military dictatorship, which itself is quite a curious <laughs> thing to think about. Um, the Beatles collectors, um, most of the sort of European uh, uh, covers would have some identifiable mark on the top. The German ones are the more collectible, apparently. I don't have any, but apparently the Germans are more collectible. You see across here the little EMI uh, record platter there, and I think the... and you've got some weird um, address on the back for some long defunct uh, record pressing plant in Greece. <laughs> it's on the bottom. Um, the opening line of the first track on a Beatles album is the count in one, two, three, four, <laughs> which a couple of people have tried since. You're a Ramones fan, the right, Ramones, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, the Ramones had one on their first LP. And of course, Springsteen, before he goes into the final highways jab with broken heroes on a lowest chance power drive. Uh, much more epic one, two, three, four, but it's, uh, these kids obviously had something, had, had, had their finger on, on some quite extraordinary pulse. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, when I was a kid, I, was, I worried that they were in the past tense, because it's the mid-70s, um, and they were on the radio a little bit. Anyway, but the second one, which is now more interesting to me looking back, which I didn't pick up at the time, the Beetleheads, Paul is picking up chicks in his first uh, song on the first side of Please Please Me, John Lennon's first lyric 
my first is a whinge about the world treating me bad, <laughs> misery. And of course, as a 12-year-old, you do not pick up this stuff. As a 12-year-old, especially off the second album, songs like Please Mr. Postman uh, was one of my favourite tracks off the second album, Twist and Shout off the first album. But, you know, the old man looking back on this thing, and you think this guy, <laughs> poor old John, in his 20s. <laughs> you know, world fame beckons, and the first thing he wants to tell the world is, it's treating him bad, <laughs> <and> misery. <laughs> That is one of the things about objects, though, is that you, you return to them throughout your life and you have this reinterpretation. The object may not change, but you do. And you were saying that one of your favourite Beatles songs of the time you now look back on as being pretty shallow. Um, yeah, so I, trying to be, we were talking about this the other day, um, trying to set this thing up. The song that turned me into a Beatles fan, which I heard on a transistor, was She Loves You. And, uh, you know, I don't have any of those, because I'm not a baby boomer, right? I can't pretend that I was watching Ed Sullivan and, you know, Elvis kicked down the door for me or I was watching the Beatles, you know, and I didn't, I didn't rob a bank that day and I stayed at home and watched it <laughs> at home. I don't know, in the mid-70s, in, the, in a, still a fairly monocultural uh, Melbourne, uh, kids of immigrants are going to school now. And I heard this song, it was the most extraordinary force of nature I'd ever heard. Mm -hmm. It's a cheesy love song, right? And it's, there's not much in it. Um, and uh, I don't think I play She Loves You all that much now, but uh, that was the one that got me going. And in fact, it was a very, always a very hard song to cue up on the tape recorder because it goes straight into the, uh, into the intro. So it's a little drum roll, She Loves You. So drum roll chorus. I never actually caught it on tape. <laughs> <laughs> Recording off the radio. Yeah. Wasn't that always tricky with the record and the play button yeah. at the same yeah. time? You'd always get one or the other. Yeah, and well, never, that cassette player never had a pause button on it. Because you could you could put yeah, you, you could, could put, set it up you and, could set it up yeah. and yeah. wait and yeah. then you go click and of course as you've got a bit more sophisticated with your mixtapes you know if you had a bad cut a bad edit you know if that if you had that remember that little clunk that would come yes. on which which signified that you were recording yeah and now see I hear some songs and I miss that clunk or that scratch on the record or something <laughs> yeah. you know it doesn't feel as genuine Crackle. if you could join me in thanking our, our guests today.